Hey, church family, I want to share with you three ways to get the most out of your online church experience. Step one, be fully engaged. We know that there's a lot of distractions when you're trying to watch from home. And hey, the best way to watch is on your smart TV using the YouTube app. Then grab your whole family, gather around, sit on the couch and tell them, hey, it's time for church. Number two, we are found people who find people. The best way that you can invite others to join you for the online church experience is simply by sharing it on your social media. And hey, you can help keep community alive by simply commenting and interacting with each other during the live stream. Number three, worship. Don't just watch, but stand up to your feet and sing loud. Grab your Bible and notebook and take notes during the message. Another way to worship is through giving. Right now we're all giving online. This is a very important time for us to continue to unleash generosity. You can give through the Rev app or go to revgive.com. And most of all, listen for God's voice and step forward in faith with what he puts on your heart. Welcome to church. Come on and stand to your feet as we worship this morning. Now I search the world.
Surrendering all. For Lord, you are life, you are love. And we thank you for your presence, oh God.
50 to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise the Lord in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him for his greatness because it's unmatched. Praise him with the instrument and dance. Church, if you have breath in your body, praise him. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great. Amen. All right, church, you can have a seat. Welcome to Revolution Church. We are so glad that you're joining us today. My name's Mallory. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And if it is your very first time joining us, we want to say welcome. We are so glad that you're joining us today. And so we want to know that you are here. And so if you'll do us a favor, if you will fill out this online connection card, you can go to revyourlife.com slash links and get that card filled out for us. We have a gift that we would like to mail you, and that's just our special way of saying, hey, thank you so much for being with us today. So church, give it up for those that are joining us for the very first time. We're so happy you're here. And if you need prayer for anything, please also fill out that online connection card. That's how we're able to check in on you and know where you're at, where you'll be able to, to pray with you. All right, church, we're about to enter into a time of worship through generosity, and we get flat out fired up around here about generosity. Yeah. That's my girl, Ashley, back there. You hear that? Hey, we have several different ways that you can give, so check out the screen. So you can go to the Rev app, and you can press Give, and you can give that way. You can also mail in a check um, to that address on the screen. You can use the giving box if you'd like to give cash. It's at the door on your way out. And then you can give online at revgive.com. And just to talk about that one for just a minute, um, in that, you can set up automatic recurring giving. My family and I give that way. It's just the very best way for us to make sure that God gets our first and our best. And so I'd encourage you to check that out, see if it'll work for you and your family. And then you can text any amount to 84321. The first time you, you do that, it'll get you all set up. And then after that, if you like to text, you could just text your dollar amount and you're done and you're good to go. So while you guys are giving, I just wanted to share with you for just a minute. Like I said, my name is Mallory. Um, I'm not um, from Texas. Oh, I know. And all the Texans are like, tisk tisk I know but I got here fast right um, so I'm not from Texas I'm from Arkansas and I grew up there my whole life and I grew up on a crop farm so my, all of my family um, are farmers generations of farmers and so my dad being a farmer uh, and now my brother 
has taken over that farm. And so it's a really cool thing and in a cool way to get to grow up. And so I got to see them just really get to plant and watch things grow. And my dad would get us on Saturday mornings and say, all right, get in the truck. We got to go watch the water. And you're like, I don't want to watch water. I don't even, I don't want to do that. But we would just drive to all the fields and we would literally watch and monitor water levels. So we did a lot of, they, they farm a lot of rice. So we would watch water levels and make sure that it, everything was growing like it should. And so this was a very tedious task and something we did all the time. And if you read the Bible, there's so many scriptures where God is talking about farming. You hear that you'll reap a harvest, you know, what you sow, you will reap. And so as a young girl, God spoke to me in those moments and connected the dots. And one of those scriptures, 2 Corinthians 9, 10, it says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And Paul's talking to the Corinthians here and he's urging them to give generously. But the other thing that he's pointing out in this scripture, it says God is the one who supplies it all, right? So God's the one who gave the seed. God's the one who gave the soil. God's the one who gave the water. He's the one who gives the sun so that things can grow. And all he's asking us to do is take those things and be the farmer, right? To steward them well, to watch the water. That's all that God is asking us to do. And so for me and my family, when we're sowing in, when we're stewarding something well, we want to give generously out of what God has so greatly already blessed us with. And so when we do that, we give to this place right here because this is where life change is happening. And this is where we're running really, really hard after people who do not know Jesus. Yeah, that's right. So we want to plant in some really fertile ground. And we wanna make sure that we're sowing right here into this place so that my life was changed here. And I know many of you have been in the same position. And so we just wanna keep doing it. Thank you, church, for being a church that's so generous to give and for sowing and reaping such a great harvest. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to give to you, Father. God, it's such an honor Lord, that we're able to be in this right here, this fertile, fertile ground, Father, where people's lives are being changed. So today, God, I just pray we can trust you, that we can step into this crazy, radical generosity, Father, so that we can keep seeing people come to know you and find the hope of Jesus. God, I pray that today you would bless this gift and bless the giver. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, church, jump back on your feet as we just continue to worship the King of Kings today. When you raise your hands, there's no power in raising hands, but there's power in what it represents, that we're surrendering ourselves right now before God. So can you just raise your hands with me right now? I feel something changing in this room. Things of the past have been made new. So come with an open heart, believing in what he's going to do. Come on, help me sing that again. I feel something changing in this room. Things of the past have been made new. So come with an open heart. Believing in what he's going to do, yeah. We want to see this. We want to see your salvation come. We want to see your glory. We're praying miracles be done. We're praying rescue stories. So Jesus, come and wake our faith and break through every doubt. And we'll sing glory as the walls come crashing down. Oh, as the walls come crashing down. I feel something changing. I feel something changing in this room. 
dry bones away he can start to move and things that we thought were dead are coming alive to worship you of sickness nothing can keep me from you Jesus you wrap me in your arms let him love you he's running after you let him love you oh to the prince of peace to the king of kings to the great I am you're the lion and the lamb to the holy one to the cornerstone to the sacrifice and to the way the come on church help me sing and to the prince of peace and to the king of kings to the great i am and to the light Let's make some noise. Come on, 10 seconds. Give Jesus a shout of praise. Amen. All right, turn around and wave at somebody. Signal to them how many hundreds of dollars you blew up in fireworks last night. Okay, awesome. Hope you had a good fourth. I'm excited you're in church. I want to welcome the whole Revolution Church family, many joining us online from home, maybe from a beach somewhere or something like that. I'm not jealous at all, all right? Uh, we've got our God Behind Bars guys in the prison. Let's make some noise for them. They can hear you. We love you guys and our military serving all over the globe. And listen, here's the thing. Our church has a mission, and I'm so proud of our church right now. I'm so proud of you because in this crazy season we've been in, the one thing that has remained constant around here is a focus to reach people and rescue people and grow heaven and depopulate hell and change one life at a time. You've been so focused on it. Thank you for being a church that understands how much the mission matters and that it takes all of us. So in that spirit, would you say the mission with, with me? Our mission is starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. Awesome. Okay, real quick, uh, if you are a teenager or a parent of a teenager, get your phone out real fast. We are working hard to kind of see what this next season of student ministry looks like. We call our student ministry The Mix, and it's for any student age uh, grade seventh up to 12th. So you can see on the screen, if you are a student, I want you to text The Mix, no space, just The Mix, to 210-880-6012. 
Pastor Jeff is going to just text you once a week or so to check on you and to stay in touch and to let you know what we're doing at the mix. And then we have a second kind of text hotline for the parents because we know, you know a lot of teenagers don't have a car, not old enough to drive yet or whatever, may not be staying connected. Parents, we have to take care of our children spiritually, especially those teenagers. Amen. So parents, I want you to text mixed news, no space, mixed news, M-I-X-N-E-W-S to 210 210- 8806012 so that you can also be in the know and if you've got questions about the mix or what it looks like you can respond right there it's a text only thing but pastor Jeff and his team they'll see it and they will get back in touch with you so make sure and check that out we're pumped about the mix and what it looks like to do student ministry to be a student movement in this next season of life that's how you can stay connected all right So I want to jump back into Essential, and this is going to be our last week. This is our sixth week of a a series of conversations on things that are very essential in the scriptures, things that Jesus said that if we're not careful, we'll kind of forget, we'll sort of just drift away from, but, but very important, very essential things in our life, essential things that I believe we've got to remember for where we are in our culture and in our country today. Very important things Jesus said. So if you missed the first few weeks, please go check them out online. We're on YouTube, Roku, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, RevYourLife.com, the Rev app. I mean, it's so easy to catch up. I wanna ask you to play catch up. Check out those messages. And today, we're gonna talk about knees before feet. Say it with me, it sounds like a nursery rhyme. Say it with me, knees before feet. One more time, like you're here knees before feet, okay? And I'd like to start by showing you one of my favorite pictures ever, all right? Now, my hair ain't that great because it was 30 degrees and it was pouring rain, but this is me and my friend, Pastor Eric Dykstra. And if you've come to church here very long, you've probably heard Pastor Eric preach. We try to have him come at least once a year. He pastors up in Minnesota. And every year I go to Minnesota and I fish with this guy. He's one of my closest friends. He's my fishing buddy. And here's the thing. I love to fish. I fish as much as I can here in Texas. Uh, There's a pond that you can walk to pretty close to our house that gets stocked with bass. But it's a tiny little pond. You you could throw a baseball across it. It's so small, which is great, okay, because they stock it with bass. So you got this tiny little pond and a ton of big, dumb bass. Y'all know what I'm saying? Bunch of big, dumb bass. Listen closely. All in this little bitty pond. You ain't got to be that great at fishing to catch a big, dumb bass. All right, they're all in this little pond. All you got to do is get some bait that looks somewhat close to what they eat, and it'll work. You'll catch a big old dumb bass, and that's what I'm used to. But when we go up to Minnesota, we don't fish for big, big dumb bass. What do we fish for? We fish for northern pike. This is a northern pike, big fish, big fish. They can fight, and this one is enormous, which is why we're both so happy. I love Eric. Ah, he's freaking out, right? Because this pike is a 38 inch pike. It's a lifetime fish. You can live in Minnesota your entire life and fish every week and never catch one of these. Sorry about you, Minnesota folk. I come up from Texas and I get them. All right. Right before this, I caught a 35 inch pike. This is a big, big fish. I was so pumped, so excited. Probably will never catch one again because I'm not up there that often, but it was an exciting moment. And I was looking at pictures this week uh, from past fishing trips with Eric because this this year, but I say, oh, yeah, this year we didn't get to do it. Thank you. That was my wife. <laughs> She's like, oh, you didn't lay me up the kids for a week. Okay, so um, this year we didn't get to do it, so I was kind of looking at the pictures and remembering and just, you know, I called Eric and we were talking about it, and I had forgotten what happened right before I caught this fish. So Pastor Eric, he's one of these people that prays all the time. Anybody know somebody like that? Like you'll be with him and he'll just start praying out loud randomly. He won't even tell you, let's pray. He just does it. You'll be driving and he starts talking to Jesus and you're like, what is this dude doing? But we we think that's weird, but what's actually weird? What's actually weird to think that's weird or to be that person, right? So, So he's that guy. He's always praying. And I had forgotten right before we went on the lake, in true Pastor Eric fashion, we're pushing away from the dock, and he says, Jesus, thank you for my friend Zach getting to come up here and fish. Thank you for the beautiful weather, which I laughed because it was freezing cold rain, 30 degrees, but to a Minnesotan, that's great. To a Texan, that's hail, all right? 
He said, Jesus, would you help us catch some big fish today? In Jesus' name. We love you, Jesus. Thanks for this amazing creation. You're the greatest fisherman ever. Help us to catch some fish. In Jesus' name. Amen. Not 10 minutes later, I catch this fish. I'm like, dang, this dude needs to be praying for me a lot, all right? And the thing about Pastor Eric is he just, can I say it this way? He ain't afraid to make a big ask. Y'all know what I mean? He is not afraid of a big old ask, all right? He ain't afraid to ask God for big, big stuff. I'm learning that. I'm, I'm learning to hit my knees before my feet. My knees before my feet. Look at what it says in Zechariah 12. It says, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to know when you read this, if you're a Christ follower, it's talking about you. Because if you're a Jesus follower, you're a part of Jesus's family. You study the lineage of the house of David, the people of Jerusalem. What does it come down to? It comes down to you and I. This is written to the family of David. It's written to Jesus followers. This is part of our inheritance. When we give our lives to Christ, part of what we get is a spirit of grace and a spirit of prayer. Now, let's break those two down. Spirit of grace, the Bible says you're totally righteous if you've given your life to Jesus. In God's sight, when he sees you, he doesn't see the sin anymore. You're wrapped in a robe of righteousness, amen? And he only sees the perfection of Jesus. That is the gospel. That's why we're here celebrating together today. It's why we can worship, right, in spirit and truth. But isn't it interesting that it couples that with the spirit of prayer, that it's not just grace, it's also a spirit of prayer. At the cross, Jesus gave us a spirit of grace, and with the Holy Spirit, we are also to have a spirit of prayer. Now, it's so good that these, these two things are together, because think about it. What, what is a spirit of grace? A spirit of grace is when you realize, man, you cannot get to heaven on your own. So thank you, God, for your grace that I get to go to heaven, not because of me or anything I ever have done or ever will do, but because of something Jesus has done, because of some work Jesus finished for me. Thank you, God. That's a spirit of grace. Now, if that's truly the spirit you have, the only thing left to do, since you can't get to heaven on your own, is talk to God about it, right? That's prayer. The only thing left after a spirit of grace is, is to talk to God about fixing your life and changing your life, you, and you end up with a spirit of prayer. The goal is a spirit of grace, yes, but also to develop a spirit of prayer, to hit your knees before your feet, to make big asks all the time of God, okay? Now, a lot of people say, well, pastor, I pray. I pray before every meal. I pray, you know, with the kids before bed or whatever. That's great. You should do that, but I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about something else that the Bible talks about. I'm talking about something else that some of our, our greatest faith leaders talked about. Let's look at some of them. The Apostle Paul. Paul, y'all, in Colossians 4, he said, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, he said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That, that's my friend, Pastor Eric. Dude's just always talking to God about everything. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I would argue we don't really pray without ceasing anymore. Um, in February, my wife turned 40. I said, what do you want to do? Do you want to have a big, huge, crazy, fun party, which that's not her personality type, or do you want to just like get away somewhere without the kids? And she was like, beach, please. Let's go to the beach. So I took her to Cabo, and right before COVID hit, we got some much-needed rest. We sat on the beach in Cabo, and you know, it's this beautiful beach scene, and it's so serene and restful, and I look around, and what do I see? I see all these people on the beach like this. For hours. Y'all, we don't, we don't pray without ceasing. We phone without ceasing, don't we? That's, that's what we do. Like, we're constantly on the phones. How about this great mind? You ever heard of him? Jesus. Matthew 21, Jesus said, It is written, My house shall be called a house of really, really great music with an amazing band. My house shall be called a house uh, of, of awesome preachers. My house shall be called... A house where your preferences, you know, you always get your way. Jesus did not say that. What did he say? He said, my house will be called a house of prayer. Jesus said the thing that will set his family, his church, his house apart is a spirit of grace, yes, but also a spirit of prayer. And then the apostles, these are the guys that started the church. 
The guys that take the church in one day from 120 people to over 3,000 people get baptized in one day, don't you know that was a rowdy church, all right? And in Acts chapter 6, what do they say? They said, we will give ourselves continually to making sure everyone in church is always happy, right? And always agrees. That's not what they said. They said, we will give ourselves continually to the thing that Jesus said his house needed to be all about since we're building his house. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. To prayer. Wow. Do you give yourself continually to prayer? Do you hit your knees before your feet? Now, maybe you're kind of more like me, and your story is more like mine. You know, I, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and my idea of prayer was that it was a, a, reli a religious duty. Like, you had to say these words in this order this many times, and then you did your duty, and you were good, right? You, and then God was happy, and everything was perfectly fine. But the truth was, for me, the prayers meant nothing. Was that because they were bad prayers? No, they're amazing prayers, like the Our Father. Jesus taught that prayer, not the Catholic Church. The prayers were amazing. It wasn't the prayers that were bad. It was my heart that was bad towards prayer. But that's kind of how I grew up, and so I just didn't appreciate prayer when I first became a, a Christian. I, I kind of thought it was this weird thing like, okay, so I pray to spiritualize my plans. I pray to basically say, all right, God, here's my plans. Now you can get on board if you want. This is what I'm going to do. Or I saw prayer as like just a list, like, okay, I'm going to go through these, God, and then you are going to be a vending machine for me. I'm going to go through these, and then I want you to drop my Snickers bar right on time, okay? Or I saw prayer like as a waste of time, because I'm a go-getter. I'm someone that wakes up going 100 miles an hour every day, and sometimes I'd start praying about something, and I'd be like, you know what, God, never mind, I'm just going to go take care of this. How about you? Do you hit your knees before your feet? I when we started the church 11 years ago when we moved to the area, I started to study prayer. I read what some of the greatest Christian minds have said about prayer. Here's, here's a few quotes that stuck out to me. Brother Lawrence said, there's no kind of life more sweet and delightful than the kind of life in a continual conversation with God. Mike Bickle said, you can only walk in the spirit as much as you talk to the spirit. And see, that's the thing, is we're called to be people who reflect the love and the light, the hands and the feet of Jesus. We're called to be people who develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, people who have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Amen? I want to develop these things in my life. But listen, I'll only develop those things in my life as much as I talk to God about those things in my life. And then the great preacher D.L. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced back to a kneeling figure to somebody who prayed. Prayer is such an essential thing that the church needs today. We don't, we don't need new technology. We don't need more ministries. We don't need to be the coolest church on the block. We need men and women who will hit their knees before their feet. Men and women who will pray and listen to God and then get up and move in the direction God calls them to move. People dedicated to prayer. Amen. We have to change what it is we run to. What have you been running to? I've seen so many people of faith run towards fear in the season that we're in. I've seen people run towards news announcements, run towards Twitter, run towards what their Uncle Bob said on Facebook about whatever's going on. Are you kidding me? We run to prayer. We run to God first. What does God say about this? God, what do you want to say to me about this thing? We hit our knees before our feet. And so what I wanted to do today was just give you some super practical things about knees before feet that I've learned over the last 11 years from Scripture. You ready? All right, I got several of them. Rapid fire. Here we go. Get ready. Number one, prayer opens the door to God's presence and power in my life. I, I want you to picture prayer literally as a door. It's this simple. And God's on the other side of the door. And you get to choose every day whether you just leave the door shut or you open up the door and talk to God. It's that easy. This is what prayer is. It's a, it's a door that we get to open to God's presence and God's power in our life. He's already promised we have his presence and power, but we have to open it up. We have to allow him to speak to us, right? And I found that what so many Christians do is they, they spend their whole life just kind of whining their life away, right? They'll whine to God, which is fine. Sometimes you got to whine to God, Amen. But it can't only be whining to God. 
It can't only be going to God like, oh, wish I had a better job, God, and my marriage and my kids, God. And we just kind of stay in the shadows whining. What if instead you opened up the door and said, God, I invite your presence and power into my marriage. God, your presence and power into my, my workplace and into me leading my kids and these teenagers. Like, like, what if you could change your situation by simply opening up the door and inviting God in? You would do that, wouldn't you? You'd figure out ways to keep the door propped open all the time. And a spirit of grace, but also a spirit of prayer, is how we do that. It's how we keep that door open. How many of you would say, you know, there's been a time, or maybe right now, where I needed or I need a crazy miracle story in my life. God, I need, I need God to move in some crazy ways. Let me see you. Put your, if it's ever happened, it's everybody, right? We've all had that. How do we access his power and his presence? We open up the door. We invite God into that miracle story. We invite God into that need that we have. Acts chapter 4 says, after this prayer, not before, after the prayer, what happened? The meeting place shook. After they prayed, they started experiencing God's power, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. When did they preach the word of God with boldness? After they prayed. They prayed, the door opened, and then God moved in their lives, and God moved through their lives. And unfortunately, so often we forget how essential it is to have a prayer life and to invite God in. Let's open up that door every day. Amen? Let's open up that door all day long to his presence and power. Number two, prayer is how I experience God's voice and vision for direction in my life. Prayer is how I experience God's voice and vision for direction in my life. So how many of you have a phone with a Maps app on it? And if you're going somewhere you don't know how to get there, what do you do? You take this few seconds to find the address, type it in, and then your phone gets you there, right? That's what prayer is. We were just joking this week. When our parents come to visit, like they're too good for the, map, the Maps app, man. They ain't going to open that thing. And then we get the call. How do I get to your house again? I can't remember the exit. I'm like, turn the maps on. It's so easy. It takes one second. Turn on the map. Prayer is the map for your soul. Prayer is your spiritual map. It helps you hear from God. It helps you receive. It's how you get to know God's voice and vision in your life. We would be crazy not to open up Google Maps when we're going somewhere we don't know how to get there, right? Same thing. We'd be crazy not to open up God's map for our life, to see what God has mapped out for us. Acts chapter 13, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, you could also say praying. That's what fasting is. It's a season of focused prayer. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. He's telling them the map. He's giving them the plan. Then after fasting and praying, after they did the prayer, after they spent time with God, they laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul, what they do? They sent them out. All right, guys, we got the map. All right, guys, we know clearly that God is saying this is what the who, what, where, when, how, why looks like. Now go. And this is actually the story of Revolution Church. If you've never heard me tell the story, um, we knew we were supposed to start a church, but we didn't know where or how or what or who. We, you know, we just had no idea. And, and so I was just pushing on doors and opportunities. I was trying to raise money and and I got frustrated, and we almost did not start a church. And then my pastor, Pastor Bill Cornelius, he, he looked me in the eye one day. I was with him, and he said, I was expressing my frustration. You know, I thought this is what God said, but I can't figure it out. And he goes, how much have you prayed about this? And the truth was, I hadn't prayed much at all about this. And I said, well, you know, not very much. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go buy a stopwatch, and I want you to pray 100 hours. Use the stopwatch to keep your time. And I don't care if it takes you 10 months, 10 years, one month. Don't you do a single thing. Don't even talk to anybody about this new church until you've talked to God. And until you're sure you've looked at his map for you. So I thought the dude was flat crazy, y'all. I was like, I ain't doing that. Ain't nobody got time for that. A hundred hours? How long is that going to take? So I go home that night. I tell Amber. She says, what did Pastor Bill say? I'm like, he said, buy a stopwatch, pray 100 hours. He's lost his freaking mind. She goes, do it. I knew she hadn't lost her mind. So I did it. I got a stopwatch and I started praying. And, and here's, I wish I could tell you some crazy spiritual journey. Here's the real and the raw, okay? Every morning I woke up 
a little bit earlier than before, and I spent about an hour with God. I clicked my stopwatch, and for about the first 10 hours, this was, this was how it went. It was me talking, 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 never listening. And I got to about the 10th hour, and I remember my prayer that day. I prayed something like this. God, I got nothing else to say to you. I'm done. I'm only 10 hours in. I don't know what else to do. And I, have you ever felt God speak to your heart? I felt God say, finally, shut up. Now I can talk. Now I can talk to you about the plan, about the vision. So yeah, sometimes it's, sometimes it's talking to God. Sometimes it's turn your phone off. Get in a quiet place and receive and listen. And here's the thing. After I finished the 100 hours of prayer, I knew exactly what, where, when, why, how. I knew exactly what we were supposed to do. Why? Because prayer is like a map. Let's use the map and let's see what God has mapped out for us. Amen? Number three, prayer gives me supernatural energy. Supernatural energy. Where's the coffee people? Make some noise, coffee people. I'm so proud of you right now. All right, let's take it up a notch. Where's the espresso people? Don't act like you're an espresso person if you put cream, sugar, strawberries, and ice cream in it. Okay, that ain't what I'm talking about, all right? I'm talking you get a shot of espresso and bam, all right? All right, where's the energy drink people? Red Bull, Monster, y'all are sick. You, you are sick people. Y'all are the most twisted people I've ever met. Y'all are crazy people, okay? Those things, oh my gosh. I've been shaking like crazy. The point is, just like those things give you like a burst of energy, man, prayer is like spiritual Red Bull, is it not? Prayer is like spiritual espresso. It's like caffeine for the soul, amen? Gosh, look at what it says in Ephesians 3. I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And what's the result of praying? I pray that from his glorious, look at this, unlimited resources. See, we're all limited, every single one of us. But he is unlimited. And as heirs to the kingdom of heaven, we have inherited everything he has, even his unlimited resources, from his glorious unlimited resources. What will he do? He will give you this inner strength through his spirit. Did you know as a believer you have something that the world that those who do not believe do not have. You can't say that. That's not fair. Listen, if you don't believe in Jesus, we love you. We think it's beautiful, biblical, brilliant that you're with us. That's, you're the very person we're most focused on right now. You're the reason we started this church. But we have something you don't have. Unlimited inner strength and peace from God as long as we open the door and receive it. Amen? So we have a choice. You can whine and stay spiritually weak or you can pray, God, give me your strength. And I don't know about you, but I have been praying like that quite a bit these last few months. Spiritual Red Bull, y'all. Number four, prayer eases my mind and my soul when I'm in distress. Anybody been stressed over the last few months? Anybody had a freak out moment the last few months? Anybody thought about sending their kids off to another country the last few months? In a moment of weakness, right? We're good parents, okay? Okay. What do we do? We, we go to God. We take it to God. He, he brings this peace that you can't find anywhere else. Now, we all have those things in life that kind of do this for us, right? Like for me, it's working out. I just have to move a little bit every day. If I don't get out and sweat a little bit, I'm not going to have a good day. It's just how I am. It, it's so ingrained in me that if I don't work out for a few days, I get kind of grumpy. And my wife, she'll look at me and, and she won't say, go pray. You know what she says? Go work out. She doesn't say, you're grumpy, stop. She says, would you please go for a run? Would you please go throw a weight around for a second? Because she knows that's what I need. How about you? When I'm stressed, I need a workout. How do you finish that sentence? When I'm stressed, I need a cigarette. When I'm stressed, I need a beer. When I'm stressed, I need video games. When, when I'm stressed, I need a vacation. When I'm stressed, I need a cupcake. Hallelujah. How do you finish that sentence? It, here's the thing. Every one of those things probably will relieve your stress for a minute, right? 
for 24 hours, but none of them are the same thing that Jesus brings. Amen? None of them ease your mind and your soul. Quite like spending some time with Jesus. There's nothing in this world that can do for your mind and soul what Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, can do. So when you're freaking out about something, when you're in distress, I challenge you to just pause a second, to stop worrying, to, to give it to God. Not, not even to stop worrying, but in the middle of the worry to give it to God. That's why Philippians 4 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. What can I pray about? Everything. Oh, I'm not going to pray about that. That's stupid. I know I'm being petty. It's still affecting me, but I'm just, you know, God's too big for that. No, he wants us to pray about everything. The big things, the little things, the in-between things. We are to tell God what we need and to thank him for all that he's done. We're to cry out to our Heavenly Father with our needs and never lose our gratitude for what he's done. And what happens as we cry out to him, then, only then, will we experience his peace, which exceeds anything else we have in the world, anything we can understand. Amen? His peace guards our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. I love that because it speaks to our current but also our future, right? speaks to what's going on right now in life. We can take it to him, but also when we do this, it, it guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. I want that. I want God's peace guarding my heart, my soul, and my mind. So I'm learning. I'm learning to have a spirit of prayer. I'm learning to hit my knees before my feet. Number five, prayer will, absolutely will transform me or my situation. Prayer absolutely every single time does something. Not always something we see, not always something we perceive, not always the thing that we had planned out, but every time you have ever prayed, every time you have ever cried out to God, something is happening. He's either just slowly changing your heart, your perspective to align with his principles and precepts, or he's actually flooding your circumstance and your situation and changing it. Sometimes it's big, crazy changes, right, that slap us in the face. Sometimes it's little bitty incremental things. But every time you've ever prayed, God was moving. God was doing something. Every time, James chapter 5 says it this way, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. So we also don't do this alone. We do it together as well, okay? So that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person. I, I want you to see this. If you're in Christ, we already talked about it. What are you? A righteous person. If you are in Christ, you are a righteous person. So this isn't talking about only the monks that live up in the mountains with no technology and they live on carrots, okay, or whatever. That's not what it's talking about. Get that picture out of your head. It's talking about you. If you're a Christ follower, it's talking about you. It says that your earnest prayers have great power and they produce wonderful results. So run to prayer. And the thing that trips us up on this one, it's just that we have such limited perspective, right? We have a loving heavenly father. He, he actually knows better than we do. Amen? He knows our needs better than we know our needs. See, I love my kids. I absolutely love them. So you know what I do? Sometimes I tell them, no. I love them, so sometimes I say, no, you will not do that. I absolutely love them. Amen, parents? So sometimes I say, no, I will not buy you that. No, you will not wear that, shout out dads of teenage girls, right? Why? Because I love you. And I know something you don't know. God loves us, and he knows a lot of stuff we don't know. It reminds me of several years ago, we went to, uh, we did a staycation. We didn't have money to leave town, so we just went to the other side of San Antonio, over by SeaWorld. We got a, a room at the Holiday Inn right there outside of SeaWorld. We went to SeaWorld all day, and here's what I did. We only had one kid back then. It was, it was Cooper, our son. I said, hey, um, Amber, I just want this to be fun. We're, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to say no this entire day. I thought it was a good plan. Daddy, can I have an icy? Yes. Can I have barbecue? Yes. Can we see Shamu? Yes. Can we ride that? Yes. 
It was fun. Can I eat a pickle? Yes. Cotton candy? Yes. Sandwich? Yes. More cotton candy? Yes. Ice cream? Yes. Didn't even think about it. Had an amazing day. We go back to the hotel really late at night. He falls asleep so fast. We all crashed. About 3 a.m., I hear. <laughs> Vomit galore, y'all. I wake up. It was like an exorcism going on. Vomit coming just all over the place. Okay, so it's so bad. By the way, don't ever stay at the Holiday Inn over by SeaWorld. They should have burned it down after this night, okay? <laughs> we call the dude at the desk. He's like, oh, okay, I'll come up. And he brings us new sheets. We call again. 20 minutes later, it's happening again. More sheets. We call again. He comes in and he, he just takes the rollaway that Cooper was on and folds it up and wheels it out with the vomit inside of it, okay? We went through multiple sets of sheets, two rollaways that night. Why? Because I want to say no when I should have said no. And sometimes God says no, because he knows better than we do. Amen? Only I want to challenge you to think of it a little bit differently, that God actually never says no. Your loving Heavenly Father, he has actually never once said no to you. He's only ever said yes to something better than the thing you wanted him to say yes to. It's not actually no, it's yes to something better. Yes to something I know that you don't know, God says. Sometimes God says, yes, I'll change your heart because you ain't even praying about this right. Your perspective is all jacked up. And his yes in that case is I'm going to make you better. I'm going to grow you into everything I've called you to be. Prayer changes something every single time. Amen? I got another one, y'all. Another one, number six. Here we go. Prayer fuels my passion to reach my world and be on mission. See, at the end of the day, we have to remember this whole Christian life thing, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about the mission we're on, and it's easy to run low on passion for the mission, is it not? He has called us to be workers, people who go out and who understand the harvest is great. Jesus said it himself in Matthew 9, the harvest is great, but the workers are few, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. I don't know if you know this about your life or not, but there are so many people you know that need Jesus desperately. They may not even know. You may not have woken up to it yet, but we are found people who find people called to radically rescue those who need to be rescued. We can't forget that. I don't care what else is going on in life. As Christians, we never get the benefit of turning inward and only worrying about ourselves. We are called to go reach people, period. I started off talking about fishing. Jesus, greatest fisherman ever. He fished for men. We fish, period. We fish, no matter what's going on in the culture around us, for people, men and women who need Jesus. We don't just pray for ourselves, we pray for them. We pray for them. You know what that does? It keeps us from having a selfish, me-only kind of prayer life. Bottom line is people need Jesus. That's why this matters so much. That's why every one of these talks in the Essential series is actually so essential because they're things Jesus said that if we don't do them, we're not being who we've been called by him to be. We're not accomplishing what it is he's called us to do in the short time we have here on this world. So, so two, because I always want to help you take action, two massive action steps, simple things that have giant results, okay? Number one, every day, hit your knees before your feet. And I'm not saying, you know, don't brush your teeth first or whatever. I'm just saying our attitude is prayer first, prayer first, prayer first, prayer first. I go to God first. I let Jesus in, lead me, guide me, speak to me, Jesus first. Every day I open the door. Every day I invite him in. Not that he needs an invitation, but my heart needs to be positioned properly. So I'm positioning my heart. And then all day long, I'm realizing and remembering the more I talk to the Spirit, the more I will walk in the Spirit. And number two, in addition to that, or maybe coupled with that, what if you did this? What if you spent 15 minutes every day 
in focused prayer. You might have to go on a 15-minute walk and get away from everybody. You might need to write your prayers in a journal. That's what I do. It helps me stay focused. You definitely need to turn your phone off and set it to the side. Maybe you need to just keep a, a journal, a list of prayers that you've prayed and how you've seen God answer, especially those times where you thought you knew best, but it turned out God knew best. So many people, though, they see these steps and they say, that's great, I just don't know how to pray. This little acronym has helped me for so many years lean into our Heavenly Father. It's the acronym ACTS. A stands for adoration. What is that? It's just you telling God why you love him. It's a moment of, God, you're awesome, and this is why. C stands for confession. This is where you get real and raw with God because he knows what's going on in your life anyway. And there's something special about confession, about telling God the truth about you, what you've done, what you've thought, what you've said, who you've become, and who you know you need to be. T stands for thanksgiving because gratitude changes your heart. Gratitude is the thing that positions your heart, focuses you on who God is. And then S, supplication, which is where you make the big ask, where you just talk to God about what it is you need. And what did he say we can pray about? Everything. It's not just big things. It's everything. Knees before feet. What if you establish this as an essential habit and discipline in your life. I'm telling you, every area of your life would change. I mean, 10 years from now, if you started to do this, you would look up and you would not be able to count the ways that God has moved in your heart. You would not be able to count the ways that God has used you in this world. It turns out it's as, it, it's as simple as spending time with him, talking to him. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what the cross was all about, right? It was about building a bridge so we could be with God again. And so Jesus, right now, we want to take a moment to just pray. A moment to confess to you that maybe we've not done this, we've not seen this as essential as it is in our lives. Maybe we've seen it as a ritual or another checkbox on the religious task list. God, I pray our hearts and minds would change towards prayer. We need your presence and power. We need to experience and know your voice and your vision in our lives. We need supernatural energy. We need peace in the middle of stressful seasons and situations. We need to see miraculous change in our world and be on mission with you. We need passion to reach our friends, our family, our community for Jesus. And so we cry out to you about all of these things, Heavenly Father. And as you just take a second and talk to God about that, you may be with us today and you've, you've never prayed. You, you're not sure that you've ever actually had any kind of an interaction with God. Listen, you can be adopted into God's family, an heir to his kingdom, his son, his daughter, on mission, making a difference just like anyone else on the face of this planet. But it starts with a moment of faith that we most often actually mark with a moment of prayer. Saying the, the prayer doesn't do anything in your heart. It's what's going on in your soul and in your mind. As you consider and think about the fact that you cannot get to heaven on your own, you can't do good enough, be good enough, you can't earn your way, none of us can. But Jesus made a way, and he gave it to us as a gift. So if you're one of those people that say, I'm not sure I've ever prayed, we invite you right now to pray to invite God into your life, to pray to receive the free gift of salvation. What's happening? You're opening your heart. You're opening the door. You're receiving a gift that God has had waiting at the door of your soul all along. If that's you, would you pray like this? Let's all repeat the prayer together so no one stands alone. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Thank you for Jesus he is Lord, he is leader, he is savior, he is friend, and so much more. I repent from my sin. I turn to you, God. Make me a brand new person. In Jesus' name, amen.
Come on, let's make some noise for anyone taking that step. All right, awesome. If you're taking that step, we want to know about it. I've got a book that I would love to send you in the mail. I just need your address. So fill out the digital connection card. Just go to revyourlife.com slash links. Hit the connection card button. Church family, let me know how I can be praying for you. And if you're taking some other spiritual step, we baptized somebody today. That was awesome. Maybe you need to be baptized. We can schedule your baptism anytime, any weekend, any service. Just get in touch with us on that connection card. We would love to help you take your next step step. All right. Let's all stand up and let's declare this together. Would you say it with me? I am deeply loved, highly favored, greatly blessed, totally righteous, and destined to reign all because of Jesus. Amen. Y'all have an amazing day.